This week on CrossFeed. Stop picking on the Messianic Lutherans. The Tennessee Church Shooting. Olympic Inspiration. Yo, Joe. Er, um, Jesus. And don't ride your motorcycle while preaching. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's edition of CrossFeed News. I am Dr. Jim Butler, service pastor in St. Luke's Lutheran Church in beautiful that of Massachusetts. And I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Welcome everyone to CrossFeed News. Yes, welcome, it's good to have you back, good to be back. Gosh, two weeks, three weeks in a row now, this is going to be a friend again. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, and now we've been doing this, you know, I said uh, a couple weeks ago that uh, you know, because we're the way that we're doing it now, that I can get it all edited and you know get it uploaded right away and stuff like that. But we've been doing it on Sundays just because of conflicts instead of Thursdays. So it you know it's probably not noticeable to people, but we're actually recording this on a Sunday, and you'll probably I'll probably be able to get this done tonight yet, um, if not tomorrow, but hopefully tonight because I've got a lot of stuff going on this week. So, yeah, and and the next one should actually come out on Thursday if uh, if Thursday works out. So, mm-hmm. I can't think of why it shouldn't. So, yeah. But yeah. who knows? I I do have a, a wedding Friday, and I may have a funeral this week. So, oh, I've got vacation tomorrow next night. week. What? I have vacation next week. Uh, and tomorrow night we have the wonderful people from Spoke Folk coming to our church. It used to be part of Youth Encounter, and um, so we're very excited about having them. I haven't had a group associated with youth, Lutheran Youth Encounter in too long. I haven't had them at St. Luke's at all, so we're very excited about tomorrow. Cool. We had our race meals again this week, which is actually why this is going late. Um, those of you who have been, who've been following us for a couple of years uh, are familiar that uh, over the past few years we've been here we've had the uh, go kart races here in town, and uh, national championship kind of deal. And our church provides meals for them, uh, and it's a f- kind of a fundraiser for us. And uh, really, the community loves to to come to and everything. So it's a very busy week for us, but uh, we have a good time doing it. And so um, glad it's done. But it, you know, it was a good week. Ate well all week, and um, so. Now I have a short week. I can relax a little bit, um, get caught up on a few things that I wasn't able to get done last week because I was so busy with that, and uh, then I go on vacation for a week. So, but I'll still be around. We'll probably still be able to record. So, I will be going on vacation. I'll be on vacation at the end of the at the end of the month. Should be around, but I take a few days uh, around Labor Day. Oh, my kids will be in school. <laughs> uh, where should we be in tonight? Oh, sorry to forget you guys. We, we don't get out here to almost the end of June, so, uh, you know, they don't start till around Labor Day. Uh, where do you want to begin tonight? Um, let's, uh, let's start with, we, we've got a downer story, and so why don't we start with that one? Uh, just to get it out of the way. But I think it's an important one that we need to talk about. Um, down in... Uh, Tennessee. Tennessee. Um, this was... Uh, for change, usually this happens at Christian churches. And this time it happened at a Unitarian church. Yeah, in Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh guy name was... Uh, Atkinson. Atkinson was his last name. Uh, James Atkinson, uh, 58 years old, and um, he did a, a shooting last Sunday at Knox at this Unitarian Church in Knoxville, saying uh, he hate, hated liberals and, and and gays, and was expecting um, he's expecting to be killed by the police. Yeah, hmm. sorry about that. He <laughs> is in custody instead. So. He probably figured that, you know, getting killed by the police would be the easy way out. Now he actually has to face what he's done. 
uh, because there was uh, one guy, there's some real heroes in the story, um, a guy by the name of Greg McKendry, who is described as a 60-year-old burly usher who stood in front of the gunman and took the blast to protect the rest of them. And so while he was being, you know, taking the bullet uh, from this guy's shotgun, they, which he snuck in in a guitar case, the there were a couple other people that tackled the guy and um, held him to the ground and uh, basically pinned him down until the police could arrive. So, yeah, he actually has to face, it's, you know, a lot of these things, they either kill themselves or the police kill them or something like that. And, um, and they actually avoid having to go through, uh, all of everything that goes along with, uh, you know, with the being charged for murder and, and all that kind of thing. He actually has to face it. However, due to the, um, nature of it, because he said he hated gays and liberals, uh, it's being investigated as a hate crime. Which is why I've got hate crime sitting up there behind me. That was, uh, that said it's, of course I've always often wondered about this thing about calling it a hate crime. And he, he killed, he, he killed people, he charged with first degree murder, in Knoxville has the death, in Tennessee has the death penalty. Uh, what more would hate crime get him? Death plus? Yeah, two counts. So, um, you know, I just, I, I think it's already, I, I don't know, I think he, he's, he's a very, very sad situation. Um, the other thing, though, that struck me kind of weird, and it goes to the fact that this is a liberal organization, but Sunday morning, their worship time, and he opens fire as they're performing Annie. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that really made me appreciate what we have. <laughs> you know, I just, I mean, I, it's a sad situation because it, you, know, you feel really terrible about what's going on here. But at the same time, it, I just had to shake my head and going, you know, that's the best they can give for hope. Sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun. Yeah. 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 We could say the, the yeah. We could do that one on uh, on Holy Saturday. <laughs> the, the, you know, Jesus is crucified. The sun will come out tomorrow. It means something completely different, though. And it's spelled no, different. And on the other hand, maybe I don't. You know, maybe it's a hard knocks life. It's this 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 thing. I don't know. I just um, yeah. It just that just struck me as kind of odd. It, it is a sad situation, though. Um, you got to feel sorry for him that he you know has this um, you know um, hatred. Hatred, right? I mean, I'm I'm. Um, your heat has made you powerful. Well, there's a, they were talking about some of his neighbors and things like that. And, uh, there's a woman who lived two houses away from him that had had a lengthy conversation and, um, with him and talked about how her daughter had graduated from a Bible college. And she ended up having to explain to him, um, uh, that she's a Christian. And she says he almost turned angry. He seemed to get angry at that. He said that everything in the Bible contradicts itself if you read it. I want you on a bet he ain't never really read it. It seems like the people that I usually hear saying, oh, the Bible contradicts itself all over, you know, are the people that never actually sat down and read it and really studied it. Um, but, I mean, this just shows that this guy had no hope. This was, he was, it says he was frustrated that the liberal movement was getting more jobs, that he couldn't find a job as a, as an engineer. Right. And that was the fault of liberals and gays. You know, this again sounds kind of bad. I kind of like the fact, though, that he, you know, um, said the Bible contradicts itself. I have no use for it. 
unfortunately, you know, too often, you know, that it's a right wing Christian whack job instead of just a, a whack job here. You know, I mean, it, it, it just seemed to hate everything. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, he's just a right wing whack job. <laughs> Yeah, you know, he may not have actually been right wing. He just may have been just a whack job. You know, the, he just hates a lot of hate, and that's all you can say. He was just a man just filled with hate, and mm-hmm. that's a very sad thing to be filled to to, to to be filled that way to to live that way. I mean, I I may not. <laughs> God only knows what he would have done if he lived in Massachusetts. Yeah, well, yeah, he wouldn't have had to go as far, probably. Not that he. <laughs> necessarily went very far, but... Sometimes I just didn't understand human behavior. Well, if in Iowa, you just could have gone to your church, you know? And, and Yeah, but, you know, our performance of Annie was a long time ago. And oh, okay. So, so, I mean, seriously, we're we're more uh, we're, we're more Christian than that, you know? We're Jesus Christ Superstar and Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> find a happy place! Find a happy place! Find a happy place! Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Just for clarification. <laughs> Although I did do, um, uh, my sermon this morning was, uh, I did a first person kind of deal. I, I stayed in the pulpit this time, but, um, sort of gave, uh, talked about the feeding of the 5,000 from, uh, Peter's perspective. All right. Went pretty well. So, but one thing I haven't tried yet is riding a motorcycle in church. I never looked back, darling. It distracts from the now. You haven't tried riding a motorcycle in church? No, I haven't. Now, there are times when, you know, we talk about in preaching, be careful because you're, uh, um, your illustration may overtake your sermon, or your illustration may overtake the point, and they might hear the illustration and forget the point. Well, that definitely happened in uh, Kokomo, Indiana. Um, at Jeff Harlow, the senior pastor at Crossroads Community Church, and uh, he was preaching on unity, and um, he had just come back from a motorcycle race in Michigan, and he was talking about being on his bike, and um, that, uh, you know, and how you become one with the bike, and he was going to sit on it and drive it out, but as he's walking it on stage, it got away from him, and he fell to the ground and broke his wrist. He drove it off a five-foot platform. Yes. So, uh, no unity in the wrist. No, no. I mean, yeah. He did it Saturday night and Sunday. Oh, August Sunday, one service Sunday morning, fine, but this time it didn't quite work the way he wanted. Yeah. I mean, all right. Now, this is another sad story. Okay. But he's okay. I mean, he messed up his wrist, but he'll be all right. Um, and hey, he got a whole ton of publicity for his church. <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to get publicity of my church for, you know, driving it off the platform and looking like an idiot, you know, that's, that's... Yeah. Uh, you never know. I mean, I can see people going, oh, well, there's a guy that really does some unique, you know, <laughs> sermon illustrations and stuff. You should go check that out. No, I see, I mean, I, I know, it seems to me again, you know, you're almost, the, the, even if it had gone okay, it seems to me that you're driving the motorcycle off the stage would almost overshadow anything else, anything you talked about. Seems to me everybody would go home that day and talk about you driving the motorcycle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was a, there was a, a pastor that was, he was actually filling in at my church. Um, and, uh, he had, he's a bow hunter and I can't remember what the, that means it's pretty example. I can't remember what the, the sermon was. It was a good sermon. I, I mean, I remembered it then. Um, and I thought it was a great illustration in that, that he was, uh, something with i mean but he had his his bow his compound bow right there in the uh you know he didn't fire an arrow or anything but uh but he had the bow in his uh, um 
in the pulpit, you know, and, and he was using that out as a illustration. And, um, there's a lot of people that, you know, that didn't remember afterward what all they remembered was he had that bow. I mean, and it was too bad because I do, you know, I don't remember either, except I, I do remember going, wow, what a great illustration. And that really, you know, really, really explained, you know, uh, the point that he was trying to make with promise. I can't remember what the point was anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's why I think we need to always be careful in our preaching that, you know, where we, we, I thought I've, and I've had my share of stories that, of course, my favorite one was the pastor who uh, told his congregation and used something in the book, Watch Out for Number One, and here's this dangerous book, and, you know, and it, you know, it, it's just the antithesis of the gospel and everything. And next week, this woman comes out of his church and goes, I bought that book you recommended. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. By the way, speaking of things, um, and, and this is kind of off the beaten track just a little bit, but just occurred to me, um, we had done the story, I think, around Christmas time about the movie The Golden Compass mm -hmm. and uh, how controversial it was and, and everything, and a lot of churches didn't like it. Um, just an update, they have announced that the sequels will not be made. It lost too much money. Huh. And... Um, Or, um, accusing the Christian boycotts of the fact it lost money. Now, I watched it on DVD. I couldn't make heads or tails out of what was going on. I just thought it was a badly made movie. And um, the books aren't very good either, by the way. I read all three books, and they didn't make a whole lot of sense to me either. So uh, that was my idea of what the problem was, was it just wasn't that good. But we won't see any more of those out. And meanwhile, the um, Pullman hated the uh, the Narnia books, and um, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader is in production uh, right now. So interesting. Uh, yep. But that's just a little bit of. Sorry, to go off on that tangent. It just occurred to me something about uh, illustrations, a thing that you had mentioned, just jumped that in my mind that that's, that's what had taken place. I um, it's funny that you mentioned that because literally right before I was here, uh, recording with you, I was talking to a teacher who had heard about the Golden Compass, heard you know, the whole the big deal and you know and everything, and she decided, well, I'm going to read them for myself and you know, and and make my own decision about them. And she says the first two are, you know, pretty innocuous and and you know, she said didn't really. Didn't, didn't really seem too bad. And she says, then you get to the third one and it all comes together and it's just evil. <laughs> so, you know, that is always one thing I'll say is, you know, when you hear about, oh, this is bad, this is, you know, evil and that, you know, and I told her, good, I'm glad you read them because, mm -hmm. you know, people go, oh, well, this is evil. Don't, you know, don't read this. Well, you know, I mean, unless it's like, you know, porn or something read it, you know, and decide for yourself whether it's good or bad. Because, you know, there's so often that, that people just, you know, somebody somewhere will react and say, oh, this is bad. And then like word spreads like an email hoax. And pretty soon it's, everyone says, oh, it's bad. Why? Well, because it, I heard it is, you know, and they don't actually think for themselves. And you know, make decisions for themselves, whether it's good or bad. Right. Well, in, in it, God is shown as a uh, rheumatic old man, decrepit, and a boy um, encased in a, a, a glass case um, or amber case. And the boy has this magic knife that can cut through anything, and he opens it up, and he fades away into dust. Um, you know... Okay, from Phil Pullman, this is what God is really like. Well, guess what, Phil? That's not what God is like. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you, you may have in your book killed off someone claiming to be God, but he was definitely a false God. Yeah. So, 
That, that was my, that's the best I could do with it, but yeah, it's just, just, I don't know, maybe now, I couldn't understand why a whole bunch of people bought them, because I think they were worth reading once I got through them. Hey, speaking of movies, though, one of my all-time favorite movies, right there, Chariots of Fire, this, um, the story of uh, the Olympic Games, and um, uh, and the story particularly, uh, why, well, they covered several people who, who were in there. Uh, the main focus was, of course, er- the great Eric Liddell, uh, great missionary to China. Fantastic movie, by the way. One of the all-time. I'll never forget going to see that movie. And my wife, my wife and I were dating at the time. We talked about the movie for the next week. Different scenes in it and everything. I haven't seen it. <laughs> you haven't seen it? No, I know. I've heard so much about it, but I've never actually. You know, it's a long movie. <laughs> oh, but it's oh, we went to go see it, and I was I would I actually bought the soundtrack to it. I was so moved by it. Um, yeah, I, I like the great. theme song. So, but anyway, uh, the neat thing is, uh, part of the loosening up in in China is that a biography uh, from um, Scotland of um, the life of Eric Liddell. Or Li Ai Rui. I don't know if you can exactly pronounce that. Uh, as he was known in, in China, uh, is being published in China. Uh, guy by the name of John Kennedy's acclaimed biography, Running the Race. And it really talks about Liddell's, uh, not only his sporting life, but his, uh, his, uh, his Christian faith. And has been translated into Mandarin, um, a very faithful translation, and is being published in China. Yeah. That, well, you know, the Olympics starts this week. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's, you know, there's been a lot of talk about China, about um, the, you know, what they are allowing, what they're not allowing. They're trying to make themselves look good, but like they're censoring internet and, you know, even to the people that are attending there and, um, you know, <laughs> like trying to make themselves look good by like putting on this mask. I even heard that hey, China. Uh, if you want to look really good, let our podcast back in. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> for the, for those of you who are more recent listeners, we we are banned in China. Our, this podcast cannot be seen, and we had a lot of Chinese listeners, by the way. Yeah, we actually did. So, um, but uh, we're banned in China now. So, um, they uh, they even. Pass. I just heard this uh, that they handed out a, a an etiquette book to their uh, to the residents of Beijing, saying things like, um, uh, "When you wear clothing, make sure that you only have like uh, a, a maximum of three different colors um, in the midst of all your clothing." In other words, wear things that match. <laughs> um, like, uh, no public spitting. Um, don't, if you're talking to, uh, visitors, uh, foreigners, there's certain things you don't talk about, like politics and religion and, and things like that, personal, you know, questions and, and stuff. And it was really interesting that, you know, they're like trying to teach people, um, you know, etiquette. And so that they're not so uncouth. And I thought, well, that really makes the people look bad. I mean, like, is it, I can't imagine that it, the people are really that bad. I mean, there's probably some, you know, just like in any American city, um, that, you know, maybe if, if those are the only people you meet or something like that, but uh, it just kind of struck me. And apparently it's working that, um, people are, are getting better socially. <laughs> But yeah, you know, there's all this this kind of stuff that they're doing. They're trying to get rid of the smog, and they can't figure out how to get rid of it. They even made factories shut down for a while and stuff, and it's not helping. And you know, they're they're trying to make themselves look good. And how they're trying to yeah. making all the all the iPods and the iPhones over there. Yeah. And 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 our wonderful MacBooks too. But anyway, back to the story of Eric Liddell. Um, Liddell actually was was actually born in China to uh, Chinese missionaries. He was in Scotland only uh, to really go to college, and it was uh, while he was there that he was running uh, he ran the Olympics as a member of the Scotland Scottish um, 
uh, Olympic team. And he probably would have been able to uh, run, they say, in 1928 and 1932. But um, after he ran in the Olympics, he felt that uh, God was calling him back to China. And so he did the rest of his work, and he went back to China and served there. Um, fought against the Japanese when the Japanese took over China in World War II. Fought against them, wound up being, and, and uh, eventually died of a brain tumor. Uh, but truly loved Matter of fact, it, I thought it was interesting, though, because he was born in China, um, that it said that, uh, um, that, that, that in a, to a certain extent, the Chinese have always said that he was a member of their um, Olympic team. He was, he was the first Chinese person to win a, a medal in the Olympics. <laughs> well, I suppose he's a Chinese citizen. But... Uh... Yeah, I mean, this is this is cool. This is the kind of thing you don't always hear about, um, you know, with sports people and that. And there's a lot of Christian athletes out there that try to get their message out, but people generally aren't real interested in, um, you know, hearing that message. They want to hear more about the sports and and stuff like that. Um, the the thing that struck me the most was that he had a chance to. It was right before his death. Um. Here, his, his, during this, uh, the fighting between China and Japan, uh, his wife and the three daughters um, went back to Scotland. And uh, in his last letter to his wife, he talked about suffering a nervous breakdown because of overwork. Winston Churchill negotiated an exchange of prisoners, but Liddell refused to go giving up his place to a pregnant woman. He died February 21st, 1945, five months before liberation. I did not know that. So, yeah, to the end, he was always looking out for other people and um, just an amazing, tremendous guy. Yes, he was. And you really, really should watch the movie because it um, was definitely worthy of, a, of an Oscar the bigger the screen, the better, because some of these close-ups that he does of, of various little objects, which is, they just catch your attention when they're, they're, they're up on the big screen. I haven't but, seen The uh, Dark Knight yet, or Spider-Man 3. That's because you live in Iowa, <laughs> and believe in movie screens. <laughs> you need to move to civilization. <laughs> No, it's it's more about having time to do it. Right. <laughs> you live, if you live closer to a city, you'd find the time to go see The Dark Knight. Spider-Man 3 has been on DVD for a while. Why you can't buy a Netflix account and see it, I don't know. But, you know, that's your issue. <laughs> I have the whole season one of Battlestar Galactica sitting here that my brother-in-law loaned to me that I haven't had a chance to watch yet. Oh, I'm... Got two episodes yet of this season to finish up, and then I'm, I'm finally caught up, and uh, I'm, I'm currently watching all the Star Trek movies again. See, I often also uh, haven't seen all of Insurrection yet. I've never watched Insurrection, so couldn't tell you a thing one about it. But now you are the big GI Joe fan, I think. As we one time we were talking, and you talked about how you. Like GI, I was always the Transformers fan. I never watched a GI Joe's cartoon, never owned one. But we talked about this guy a while back, I think. No, this is somebody uh, different. This is somebody different. Yeah. yeah, because now we did talk about these sort of Jesus action figures and stuff like that that actually are in uh, like Walmart and stuff like that. They're in mainstream stores, and they're. I've seen there's like there's Jesus there's um there's like Samson with a uh the donkey's jawbone in his hand and some stuff like that. But uh this guy the uh Don Levine who created the the GI Joe doll or action figure um let's make that clear. <laughs> and um so he You played with the dolls. <laughs> Uh, I see. I had I had GI Joes. They had all the cool vehicles. Uh, I only had one Transformer. 
Um, actually, what I had the most was Star Wars action figures. I had a whole bunch of that stuff. But um, see, I, I predate you. I played with Major Matt Mason, so you probably wouldn't even even have an idea what that <laughs> even is. Nope. <laughs> nope. I love Major Matt Mason. So anybody out there who's you know pushing fifty, you you remember him. But anyhow, so uh, this guy, he was creator of GI Joe, and now he's making the Almighty Heroes toy line. David, Jonah, Samson, Queen Esther, and they're selling very well in Christian bookstores. Uh, he also has a um, three thousand dollar Noah's Ark bounce house, which I don't know if it has a um, swimming pool outside of it or not. Have you have you seen what these things look like? No, I have not. Okay, all right, I got I got one for you. Uh, here we go. I think this is it. There. Almighty Heroes. All right. These, you've got, uh, let's see, if if I'm seeing this right, you've got Samson in the front there. He's got a stick with a donkey jawbone at the end of it. Um, and then that's Deborah. Um, it's the woman in the front with a sword and a shield. And then in the back, you've got... Uh, You've got uh, on the right. You've got Noah with the mop, <laughs> which cracked me up. I think it's a mop. That's what it looks like. And then um, on the other side, you have uh, Queen Esther, which looks like she's holding some sort of magic wand or something like that. Uh, I imagine it's the scepter that she, the king's scepter that she touched. Um, and then you have the guy that looks like. Um, uh, What's his name? Rama Tut, the 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 king, <laughs> like the kind of pharaoh outfit with a big sword and shield. That's Moses. And then the guy with the purple uh, superhero armor and a cape that looks kind of. I was trying to figure out who he looks like. Um, kind of reminds me of. Um, oh, who's that Marvel guy that faints at the sight of fire? Can't remember his name. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he's wearing this this bizarre purple armor and a yellow cape. That's David, and he's got a sling, of course. Wasn't the whole thing with David that he didn't wear armor? <laughs> that he tried to put on Saul's armor and he couldn't. Actually, he reminds me of the character uh, Ozymandias from um, Watchmen. Okay. See, no. that's that's another one that that I need to I need to read that before the movie comes out. You need to read Watchmen. It's one of the great comic uh, graphic novels of all time. And that's what I've heard. Calling out a comic book is way underdoing it. Very, very kind of de- deconstructs it. Okay, I mean, anyhow, what's the most interesting thing about this guy who's you know hits the Christian Booksellers Association thing and the Christian retail things and sells this in Christian bookstores and everything. Of course, is the fact that he is Jewish. <laughs> yeah, you know, he's. You know, why did he do this? He says, "Well, um, uh, Donald Levine, being in the marketing business, likes a niche market like that." Yeah, because there's two billion Christians. Yeah, here it says uh, they embodied the universal theme of good versus evil. The designer, nevertheless, said he was moved to the, the line by a less idealistic fact: there are two billion Christians in the world. <laughs> you know, there's money to be made here, man. <laughs> So, uh, they, you know, these are. This is done in the same. For those of you listening that are sitting there listening to my um, description of these guys, um, it's done in the same style as, uh, like the Spider-Man uh, pals or whatever they're called. They kind of like the real big feet, so they can stand up um, and uh, and the the heads are a little smaller and they're kind of big bulky bodies and that so it, because of it their their center of gravity's lower and so you can you can stand them up more easily 
I mean... Yeah, kind of a Japanese anime style, almost. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe a faux uh, anime uh, manga style, but... Um, so. Okay, no, I didn't see that. I'm glad you added that picture. I found G.I. Joe, because this is the creator of G.I. Of G. Joe, but uh, you, you actually found the Almighty Heroes. Yeah, I had, there, there, you know, there's a buck to be made. <laughs> a, well, you know, the great uh, musician, late musician Keith Green once said, there's money to be made in Jesus' name, and the world is going to make it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he said, you know, that, and he's right, you know, there's money to be made in Jesus' name. Uh, our last story, but you think now he, he's a a, um, a Jewish guy? Do you think he'd become a messianic Lutheran? <laughs> I don't know if there's money to be made in that. This was a uh, what? I was trying to figure out the picture. It's it's not coming through real clear on this end. Oh, it says Messiah Lutheran Church, and it's a whole bunch of it's from their web page. Okay, that's what I figured. <laughs> This was a weird um it's it's a blog post but it's kind of weird cuz it's a corrected blog post cuz the guy that that wrote the blog post doesn't really know a whole lot about Lutherans about um what a messianic Jew is or um about how churches name themselves. <laughs> All right. Um, background. For, uh, the Republican National Committee has uh, a page called the Barack Book, and it's uh, a parody of Facebook, um, but it's used to make fun of Barack Obama. All right. Typical kind of nasty politics uh, parody kind of thing. And... Um, I didn't think it was all that funny, but, you know, they're trying. <laughs> but, uh. Well, I mean, if you uh, look at some of the people, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, Tony Rizzeco is, uh, you know, one of his friends, and William Ayers uh, is another friend, so. So they, um, they, they listed as his employer, uh, Messiah Lutheran Church. And, uh, and then he's talking about Messianic Lutherans. Okay. Now, here's a, what we really need to do is clarify. And, and there was a guy that wrote in who is a Missouri Synod Lutheran <laughs> that wrote in to sort of clarify this for him. He did a pretty nice job of it. All right. There's people that go to church is named like Messiah Lutheran Church or Christ Lutheran Church means the same thing. Um, or, you know, St. Paul's or, or, or St. Luke's or whatever, you know, and they name their churches different things, different, you know, they used to either, uh, you know, biblical terminology or, um, or, you know, whatever, uh, to name their churches, people from the Bible and stuff. And then, uh, you have churches that are, um, messianic, uh, messianic Christians who are, uh, typically Jew or Messianic Jews. Sorry, Messianic Christian is redundant. Um, Messianic Jews are Christians who are of Jewish descent and who typically these churches are Christian churches, but they like to hold on to their Jewish heritage. Um, not the, the religion of Judaism, but rather the, um, the old festivals and the holidays that they grew up celebrating. And, um, which is fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. And we've talked about that before. All right. And then there's, there's, um, there's also, we've talked about the, uh, apple of his eye, uh, organization, which is a Missouri Synod Lutheran organization that does Jewish evangelism and talks about, um, they spend a lot of time talking about, uh, what it means to be a Messianic Jew and, and stuff like that. And, <sighs> So this was, you know, really the, the real story here wasn't so much the, um, that it was linked to Messiah Lutheran Church. The real story was how, 
completely whacked the, the story got because the guy that wrote about it didn't know what he was talking about. No, the guy who put it in the blog post there has yeah. no complete idea on this Mark Abender from the Atlantic. Um, what, what I like is, yeah, there really are Messianic Lutherans. Most of them live in Missouri. The church has branches in California, Nebraska. And I was in there looking this point. <laughs> now, we, I have, I have argued that we really should look seriously at changing the name of the Lutheran Church of Missouri. Just for this reason. Because they think that all Missouri you know, Synod people are in Missouri. That's right, you know. Well, I remember when I was in, um, Kansas City one time, and, um, they had information about moving and said, if you're interested in, you know, Lutheran schools in Missouri, call the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And they gave the, the, the LCM, the Missouri District Office, and said, if you're interested, uh, in Kansas, call the Lutheran Church Kansas Synod. <laughs> <laughs> they gave the Kansas District Office. Um, but, you know, I mean, when you're, when you're geographical in that name, people are going to think that's really where you're located. You know, we should just go back to the original name. Well, I mean, the original English. Um, it was originally German, but, you know, the, uh, the Evangelical Synod, the Evangelical Lutheran Synod of Missouri, Ohio, and other states. That's right. Unfortunately, of course, the little Norwegians took that name and the Evangelical Lutheran Synod in uh, that's the other problem is that once well, once guy said that we really don't have a a name now that's you know all the good names have been taken um, you know so what's left for us and I've often did, for for those of you who aren't Missouri Synod Lutherans there's a um, very small group um, called uh, the SELC district you know it's, it's they're Slovak and it was the Slovak Evangelical Lutheran Church. And they merged with us, and it, they 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 got away from the, the Slovak and just called themselves the Synod of Evangelical Lutheran Churches. And I've often thought that's what we ought to call ourselves, just just adopt their name, the SELC, Synod of Evangelical Lutheran Churches. Well, I, I was talking to somebody else one time about this, and um, and and he had a great suggestion. He said, "Well, okay, first of all, the the ELCA, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, you know, they got the really good name." All right. Yes, they did. All right. That that's I mean that that's a great name for a church body for a Lutheran church body. He says, you know, what they should do is give that name to us because we're the ones that really ought to have it, and then they could be friends with religious ecumenical differences or Fred. <laughs> now we just lost all of our ELC listeners. <laughs> And I know we have a few we're used to, but <laughs> so you don't know if that's to our ELCA brothers and sisters. I just thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> and really, if if you know your church body, you probably are laughing right now too. And that's okay. <laughs> but uh, you know, at well, well, one time, of course, when before that church body merged, and I, I knew that name was going to be the ELCA. It was one of the things. But one of the uh, uh, proposals was Catholic Church Lutheran Synod or something like that. It was a very odd name. And I thought, bad name, call yourself that. And Of course, you know, the, 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 then there, there are those within that church body. It was a merger of church bodies. Uh, the, the Lutheran Church in America and the American Lutheran Church and the Association of Evangelical Lutheran Churches all merged into it. A little bit of history again for everybody. But um, um, there are some people who say that ELCA stands for everything LCA because they got everything their way. Nobody else did. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> so there's there are those who say that's the meaning, but uh, no, they do have it. Um, there was a Finnish body that merged with the LCMS one time. Um, we could, you know, borrow their name, the National Evangelical Lutheran Church. That works. Mm -hmm. See, the other problem is we use this word synod. The word synod, for those who are not familiar with it, means walking together. And, uh, and the idea is that we walk together, we share a common faith, and, um, and you know, we were able to, to serve together and worship together and and that, um, and the idea is also that you go from one Missouri Synod Lutheran Church to another, and you should expect, while you know you're going to find some differences, that you should find the same teachings throughout. 
um, for the most part. And, um, and so, but you know, nobody knows what synod means. Usually can't even pronounce it. <laughs> oh, even in Missouri, I heard it called synod. Yeah. <laughs> Frequently <Yeah>. like synod. <laughs> synod. Yeah. Synod. And, but the other part of that, by the way, is the other reason that we're called that is that to highlight the fact that the synod as a church body is not a church. It is a collection of churches, but it is not a church. And uh, that's that's one of the you know the other thing too to you know part of that name um, that to say that that that, that we're, we're a synod a group of churches, but we're it is not technically a church in and of itself. Though we'll often call it say say it is. But uh, anyway, so it's a. Um, very complex thing, but it, yeah, it's just funny to read this thing and, you know, that this may, here's somebody who has no idea what he's talking about and it shows. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, but yes, even here in Massachusetts, in Fitchburg, there is a, um, old Finnish congregation called Messiah Lutheran Church. And, uh, matter of fact, when I was at the uh, church camp a few weeks ago, that's the congregation that that's the church that owns that camp. Okay. So maybe you've got church stories. Maybe you don't know what a Missouri Synod Lutheran is. Maybe you think we're located in uh, uh, Cape Girardeau or something. But maybe you've got other opinions. Maybe you want to show us pictures of your motorcycle that you've driven off the <laughs> parking lot. Whatever you've got pictures of or stories to tell, please let us know at podcast at crossfeednews.com. Or if you're watching this in iTunes, you just click on the screen and uh, it'll take you to our feedback page. Or if you're watching this in YouTube or wherever or Yahoo video or MySpace or one of a whole bunch of other video sites that this is posted at, uh, you can just leave a comment uh, right below the the, uh, video there and we'll get that comment as well. I'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you think. Which what's your favorite uh you know, religious action figure? Or or what what do you think should be the next religious action figure? Superman. Oh yeah. Jesus. <laughs> dressed in Superman. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've rehashed that one before. But, that's right. So there it is. That's that's Jim for you though, because... <laughs> you know, he, if you 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 can't see the underneath his his shirt, <laughs> the big S. <laughs> no, that's not this. Uh, I'll, I'll wear that next week, though. But I do do have that. You have in the past. The <laughs> yes, I have in the past. Um, no, actually, for of course, for for Warner Brothers, the um, the Messiah is Batman because. He's earned them four hundred million dollars so far in three weeks, and so they're, you know, they're they're you know bowing down to the black bat right now. <laughs> I saw a headline that said uh, uh, something like uh, Sony's really hurting um, financially. <laughs> they need another Spider-Man movie. <laughs> Man, kids, that's enough for one night, eh? So, hey, have a good rest of the week, everybody. Enjoy yourself. It was good being with you tonight. Thank you for listening and taking part. Dale, we'll see you later on. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless. God bless. Bye-bye.